Have you seen the as to cross video? As to cross law video. Cross made a lore video. Huh? You can listen, you can't be you can't be good looking, funny, and be building a destiny empire doing PvP, weapon reviews, swabs, and the law. You have to leave something for other people. The law is the only thing I've got. Please! Asagro, stop this madness! Please. I'm a new father! Don't destroy my business! Welcome back, Guardians. In all seriousness, it is great to see other Destiny content creators dipping their toes into the lore. I really like Astacross. I think he brings a lot of entertainment to the lore scene. So if you missed his Lightfall prediction video, I will link it below. I sort of started joking about making a better Lightfall prediction video than Astacross. You know, just to show him who the lore daddy is. And at first, I thought there was nothing really to talk about, no overt hints about Lightfall. But then I started researching the Egregore, the fun guy in Season of the Haunted. We see it on the Leviathan, we see it spreading in the helm. And I felt like the Egregore was a really important piece of lore, and the threat of the Egregore is not immediately obvious. And it's also somewhat dismissed. I mean, I didn't even see anyone comment in game, like Zavala or Ikora on the egregore spreading in the helm. The more I researched, the more I started to believe that the egregore is going to set up or at least be significant in Lightfall. And this could happen in multiple ways, from infecting guardians and suppressing the light, connecting the darkness, or even communicating with the witness. So this video is going to be divided into three parts. Part one, the egregore origin story that you likely missed, the Drifter's Discovery. Part 2, what we currently know about the Egregore from Eris and the Drifter's experiments. And Part 3, putting all this together to make a Lightfall prediction. Very quickly, the winner of the Synaptic Spear was chosen. It was drawn on stream, and I've already made contact with the winner. Congrats to Danny. Okay, Part 1, the Drifter's history with the Egregore. The Egregore has been within the lore for quite some time. The Ancient Apocalypse gear from Forsaken tells a five-part story about how the Drifter traveled to an icy planet and discovered these creatures that suppressed the light. This story gives us an incredible amount of detail surrounding the potential dangers of Egregore. And of course, if Egregore can suppress the light, it would fit very nicely with a Lightfall expansion. So let me tell you about the Drifter Egregore origin story. The Drifter initially went on this expedition because he was trying to find a light suppressing weapon because he had already witnessed light versus light battles and wanted a weapon to suppress the light, similar to that of Thorn. Have a listen to the Ancient Apocalypse Hood. It reads, Anyway, my crew, or a little subset of it, we leave the system together. The dawn of the city age at that time. We were looking for something greater than the light because we had seen that light can be the cause of so much strife. We searched far and wide, must have been hundreds of years. We found a planet beyond the system, bristling with an energy that repulsed light. Naturally, we were curious. We landed, intended to settle and conduct the research necessary to make this energy portable. A weapon at a legend called Thorn had similar light repressing capabilities. It seemed promising, but hand to my heart, it was cold. Humans were not meant for that place. Every once in a while, a member of the crew would succumb, died where they stood or sat. Thank the planes for our ghosts. Okay, so the Drifter and his crew, or a subset of it, landed on this planet because they thought that the planet naturally suppressed the light somehow, and they wanted to investigate it further. But it turns out the light suppression was originating from these creatures on the planet, not the planet itself. Have a listen to the ancient apocalypse robes. It reads, So there we are, on the cold hunk of ice with no name, just me and my crew, everything peachy keen. We discovered some kind of alien monolith, a facility left by the inhabitants of that planet long gone by then. But trapped inside was a creature. 
in a cage of some sort, frozen in ice. An exhibit? Was it some kind of zoo? Still not sure to this day. We should have brought a scientist. All we had were, well, guys who thought we looked tough in dark colors. During our long stay on that planet, we found many of those monoliths, each with their own captured creature. Anyway, this thing, the creature, looked like it shared common bioenergetics with the hive, but there were no records then or since that I've seen of humanity's encounters with them. And the creature had a property the hive did not have. It produced a field that repressed light, like a darkness zone, but contained to a gooey, vacuous form with no head. The anti-light fields we had detected from orbit that spread across the planet, it was these things. Our ship scanners indicated thousands of them were on this planet with us. The Drifter would go on to describe how these creatures were not just confined to the monolith cages, but also roamed the planet. This is how they began to lose members. The planet was so cold, sometimes they would die in their sleep, but usually this would not be a problem for a guardian. However, these roaming creatures were suppressing their light. So when they did die from the cold, game over. Have a listen to the Ancient Apocalypse Gloves. It reads, My crew and I quickly learned that the creatures in the monolith facilities were not the only ones on that damn rock. Plenty of them roaming around out in the wild, where it was cold, but less cold than the frozen cages that contained the ones in the monoliths. How'd we find out? Well, one of us died in our sleep. Not that uncommon or tragic, actually. Happened a lot, damn cold out there. Except this time that fellow's ghost couldn't resurrect him. Turns out one of those creatures just slithered by, and close proximity to it from inside our shelter just silenced that poor bastard's light. It was unfortunate, but it also lit a fire under us. The next morning we realized we had a potential weapon on our hands that could change everything in battles of light versus light. Okay, so the Drifter and his crew tried to work out how to contain this creature. The Drifter believed that they needed to replicate this freeze tech that they could see in the monoliths. Even though the planet was very cold, the monolith cages were colder and able to contain them. This is told to us in the Ancient Apocalypse Boots lore tab. However, as more of the crew fell to the creature's light suppressing abilities, they began to turn on each other. At one point, the last four remaining members, including the Drifter, lost their light, and they opened fire on each other. The Drifter was the only one to walk away. Have a listen to the Ancient Apocalypse Bond. It reads, All four of us lost our light, and we knew it. We looked over at the monolith creature in its frozen cage. It seemed to stare right back. I think I mentioned we're all raving psychos at this point. Well, we did what all measured raving psychos would do. We thought we each had been betrayed by the others. We drew on each other. To this day, I'm not sure how many of those guys drew intending to kill, but I'll tell you this, I was the only one who walked out. The creature in that monolith watched it all. When it was over, I stuck a finger straight up at it. It was just me now. How'd I get from there to here? Maybe I'll get to tell you that story someday. We'll see if my gambit makes it that far. Right. So that is actually where the lore on the armor ends. However, the story does continue in Season of the Drifter in 2019, more specifically in the Illicit Reaper Bond lore tab. This is some of the most important lore surrounding how the Drifter escaped the icy planet. Have a listen to the Illicit Reaper Bond lore tab. It reads, To this day, I don't know whether that planet, with its numerous monoliths, was meant to contain those beasts or breed them. Some of those morphs were caged, some walked free as we did. So, how'd I get from there to here? We had no ship. We had no way to contain those anti-light creatures that had been the whole point of the trip in the first place. And the craziest thing happened. My ghost snapped. What do I mean by that? Let me step back. I think all this time my ghost was hoping I would fall in line, that I just needed time to take up the mantle of the traveler, my rebirth ride. But that had never happened. It took hundreds of years, but my ghost finally flipped. How? Well, our escape was all its idea. If we could modify its light to replicate the energy effect of the monolith cages, it might be able to contain the creatures in the same way. But we'd need parts, ghost parts, and we knew where we could get some. The ghosts of my former crew all fled as soon as their charges hit the dirt. So me and mine, we hunted them. 
and then it came time to perform the modifications. Are you sure about this? I asked. There were lasers all around us, scrounged from my crew's wrecked ship. Just make sure it works, it said. So I began, sparks flying around me as I cut into its armor. If I died to the cold before I finished, all would be lost. It spoke over the din of the work. Hey, there's always hope. For what it's worth, I'm proud of you. It was the last thing my ghost ever said, and the last lie it ever told. The next morning it was forever changed, but it had a brand new shell of armor, reinforced by the guts of five other ghosts. Its eye was bright red. It could no longer speak. The blue setting was still there, accessible whenever we needed it, but the red setting would save our lives. It was kitbashed and jury rigged, but it could replicate the energy of the cages. We froze every creature we came across, brought all of them on board a new ship I cobbled together, now that we were free to explore that ice trap of a planet. It was a trash fire of parts I lovingly dubbed the Derelict, a ship that I added to as I journeyed back towards home. Ghosts could now tap into spectrums of light no one on Earth had yet seen. Spectrums beyond the light. Don't get me wrong, I'm the herald of the dark. This was a kit bash job. But it was a renaissance for us. Gambit, Banks, Motes of Dark, the Derelict. They were all innovated out of that red setting. And that's when I suppose y'all met me. I think it's time I got back into Gambit. You should too. Wowza, it is crazy to read this lore from 2019 and see how relevant it is to right now. Not only did the Drifter capture these light suppressing creatures, but he also modified his own ghost after hunting down the ghosts of his crew and allowed his ghost to tap into spectrums beyond the light. Now, you may be asking, how does this relate to the Egregore? There are a couple of possibilities. The creatures that suppress the light are in fact the Egregore or the creatures produced the egregore, or the egregore is a separate fungi that was on the creatures. The main thing is the drifter 100% got egregore from this icy planet. And here is how we know this. When you load into Gambit, you see these icy containers behind you and the drifter. At the time, we didn't have a name for it. We could only speculate that this was the creature or some form of the creature that the drifter extracted from the planet using his modified ghost. However, when the exotic mission for Dead Man's Tale was released, we boarded the Glycon, and the Glycon contained the same looking creature plants, and it was then given the name Egregore. So now we can assume that the drifter obtained Egregore from that icy planet. Like I said before, I don't know if the creatures mentioned are the egregore itself because they are described as more creature-like than plant-like, but we can be 100% confident that the drifter got the egregore from that planet with the light suppressing creatures. This season, Season of Haunted confirms this. Have a listen to the Eidolon Pursuant Plate Lore Tab. It reads, You've had this for years and you never thought to mention it. Eris runs her fingers over the grime clouded containment glass, housing a large growth of egregore within the drifter's derelict. Wasn't hiding it, drifter rolls Eris's ahamkara bone over his knuckles. Ain't nobody ever asked. Hell, you've walked by it before, moon dust. We haven't the time. Tell me, what have you learned from the egregore sample? Drifter wrinkles his face and looks up to the massive contained growth. Uh... Eris massages annoyance from her brow. She sees the playful coyness in his eyes, the hidden information he holds as a bargain for some trade. Do you at least remember where you found it? Sister, you don't want to know. Eris locks her eyes on the drifter's face. He staggers back awkwardly and shrugs. I see little nothing in the middle of nowhere, doesn't have a name, and you don't want to go there alone. But you could take me? Eris tests his defense. Right, so as you can see, really important lore that essentially describes how the Drifter collected this egregore from this icy planet and how it, or at least the creatures associated with it, has light suppressing capabilities. I speculate that the Drifter's specimens have never impacted Guardians because they have been in containment. The odd thing is, we come into contact with the egregore on the Glycom, the Leviathan and even the Helm, and our light remains intact. I have a feeling that there may be a subtle difference between the creatures the Drifter found and the actual Egregore. For example, maybe the creatures the Drifter found on the icy planet were not the Egregore itself, but rather creatures with the Egregore fungi, and through the combination they could suppress the light. 
regardless, I think we should assume that the egregore under the right conditions can suppress the light. Of course, this makes for great theory crafting considering the next expansion is called Light Fall. Now, this is not the only thing we know about the egregore. Let's move on to part two, which explores the experiments that the Drifter and Eris Morn conduct on the egregore. The whole reason that the Drifter is helping Eris is because he is familiar with the Egregore, and in fact, he is the one to give Eris information on how to conduct these experiments. The first thing that the Drifter tells Eris is that the Egregore sings when you burn it, and that it has some connection with the Pyramid ships. Have a listen to the Eidolon Pursuant Plate. It reads, It is strange. When Savathun drew Mars back into our space, it was free of the Egregore. But the Glycon and Leviathan both returned rampant with fungal growth. Why? She asks. He gives in. You know, it sings if you burn it just right. Drifter thumbs behind him. Subsonic resonance in a funny way with pyramid tech. Is that so? You don't trust me? Following the information, the Drift and Eros go to the Ziggurat on Europa to experiment with the Egregore and see how it interacts with pyramid tech. Following the Drifter's instructions, Eris burns the Egregore and has a vision. Yes, the Drifter just convinced Eris to smoke your plants. The Eidolon Pursuant Pants reads, She lights a stalk at both ends, according to the Drifter's instruction. Ashing spores furl into dense clouds that envelop her body, obscuring her sight in soot black shroud until it blocks out all else. Faint whispers. A coral swell through turbulent winds tone that forms words across the surface of her mind. You hear it? Drifter asks, his voice a whisper outside her awareness. The ziggurat resonates like a tuning fork. The vibrations themselves take shape within the smoke and Eris is drawn towards somewhere distant and empty. She follows and the smoke swirls and points of color like stars, separated by lonely rifts of black expanse. Echoes radiate from the black deep like graviton ripples through space. They wash distortion over the stars until breaking against four other points. Two greater, two weaker. Ghostly strands of incorporeal egregore between them. She then sees the pyramids of Europa, Luna and Savathun's throne world. As one, their structures melded and overlapping. The connections cauterize in her mind like a vivid memory. Eris blinks and the sensation is gone. The stalk is ash in her hand. Eris is extremely interested in these visions of the pyramid ship produced by the Egregore, so she goes to the Lunar Pyramid for more information and experimentation. She conducts the same experiment with burning the Egregore, which confirms her suspicions. The Egregore connects points of darkness. More specifically, it connects everything back to the Witness. The Eidolon Pursuant Bond reads, Egregore connects points of darkness, resonates with pyramid constructs, but I cannot decipher their communications. Still, the Lunar Pyramid, the European Pyramid, and both Glycon and Leviathan all converse with the same distant point. What Rolk spoke to, so does Callus. It is gravely concerning. The Eidolon Shell Lord Tab would even give further clarification, likening the Egregore to a nervous system that connects the darkness. Have a listen, it reads, but a certain hidden contact, Eris Morn, has informed me that the fungus is similar to a synapse within a nervous system. She claims it is a physical manifestation of the darkness, like stasis. But unlike stasis, it appears to be an impure manifestation. Her words, not mine. So already we have a ton of information about the Egregore. We have the OG lore from when the Drifter first discovered it and how it can suppress the light. We now know that it forms this nervous system for the darkness, connecting everything back to the Witness, but that's not all. The in-game dialogue gives us even more lore. This brings us to part three of this video, how this may relate to Lifefall. Think about how dangerous Egregore already is and listen to the dialogue in the actual game. The first one, if Guardians breathe in the spores, it connects you to this darkness network system. Have a listen. There's spores in the air here. Same kind we'd seen aboard Callus's research vessel Glycon. They don't seem to be harmful. Aspirating the Egregor spores allows them to take root in your body. While they are symbiotic, they are also short-lived. But for a time, 
They join your consciousness to that of the mycelial network and other minds that would witness you. The second is that the egregore feeds on death. Have a listen. Do you know these fungi are drawn to the unique psychological phenomenon of death? The moment of true terror before life ends. The death of sentient beings fosters the growth of these fungi. Normally, it takes centuries for them to spread like this. But... But Callus sacrificed countless lives to feed his pet project. This is horrifying. Have you put it all together yet? Let me just summarize this entire video in one scary paragraph. Egregore can suppress the light. Breathing in the spores connects you to this darkness network that feeds back to the witness. Egregore feeds on death. Guardians literally die and are revived over and over again. My prediction is Egregore has created a ticking time bomb networked within Guardians, waiting for the witness to trigger it. And once triggered, Lightfall will begin. And with that, that concludes this latest Destiny 2 lore episode. If you'd like to support the channel and cannot think of a comment, leave the word Lightfall. As usual, it has been a pleasure. This is Marlin Games. Peace.